Shalom and welcome to Nazarene Israel. My name is Norman Willis, and this is just a quick administrative announcement. Uh, we are obviously having some internet challenges, some other technical challenges. We've got, uh, we have an electrician come out and verify the electrical system. Apparently there's static electric charge on the system. It's causing a lot of issues. Uh, please pray that Yahweh will help us to resolve these issues uh, in his perfect way and in his perfect time. Uh, but we're hoping to provide you with a stable streaming opportunity is steaming a stable live broadcast so please pray for us as we work towards this uh, we will need to upgrade our electric and we need to upgrade our i i guess we're we already ordered starlink this last week because we have to have a stable transmission so thank you very much for your prayers that yahweh will give us a stable transmission base and we also thank you uh, that he for your prayers that he would raise up support for his ministry through his elect. So thank you very much. And now we return you to the broadcast. Shalom. And there it is. Praise Yahweh. Thank you very much for your prayers for our technical issues. Our Moises has been wonderful. Uh, praise Yahweh uh, for his provision. We have some solutions on the way, we hope. In the meantime, please pray for the transmissions. Uh, welcome to Nazarene Israel. My name is Norman Willis, and this is our Midrash on Parashah Emor for 5784. And again, thank you for your prayers for the technical situation. I'm uh, I might have some giftings with regard to scripture, uh, technical, I need a lot of help. So thank you very much for your prayers, uh, <clears throat> but we're going to bring you our best. We have some static issues here, we believe. So thank you for your prayers that uh, we can get the static situation resolved and uh, bring you our best. So this is our presentation on Yeshua, our perfect high priest or our perfect priest, our perfect example. So in our parasha, we want to begin actually, uh, first of all, uh, we, I want to give, we want to give some more emphasis to the questions here because and, and I spent a lot of time praying about this, spent a lot of time in prayer this week over the questions, and I, I really appreciate the questions that people, it sounds like we're getting some real genuine questions like what, you know, what, what about this? Because I know there's a lot of, uh, oh, I remember when I first got called into the Messianic movement. <clears throat> So uh, 5759, so 1999, uh, Yahweh saved me in a miracle. And I knew at that, well, first find out, did the Messiah already come or not? Daniel 9, 25 and 26 is the easiest, the quickest uh, shortcut to that. There's many other ways to show it. Uh, and then after that, what did he come to teach? What did Mashiach Nagid come to teach? What did one like Moses want to show us how to do? Well, he wanted to show us how to walk out the Torah, not the Talmud, not the Zugot traditions, but to walk out the Tanakh, the written Torah of Moshe. So uh, that's what he came to do. And uh, our people, so just for those of Judah to, to bring you up to speed, so our people went into Asaph's house for 1,260 years. And then we left Asaph's house, what, what the Protestant Reformation was all about. So, um, yeah, and so since the, the Protestant Reformation was great in one sense, is that the, the Protestants began referring to their Bible rather than to the words of the Pope. So they began to become more biblically based, so both in the Renewed Covenant and in the Tanakh. But one of the traditions was that the Renewed Covenant does away with the Tanakh. That's one of Asaph's traditions. And it's frightening how much Asaph's traditions still reign in the house of Joseph, the house of Ephraim today. Uh, so I remember when I first got called, I was just, I was soaking up what was the ambient teaching in 1999, 2000, 2001. And I just, you just kept having questions. You know, I just was like, it's just, things just don't, something's not right. I just, you know, so I'm, I'm reading my scriptures 
and I'm what I'm anyway. Uh, so next thing I know, I'm in ministry. <laughs> but we're all supposed to be in our scriptures rather than in our traditions and rather than what seems good and right in our own eyes. So there's a lot of problem. Uh, there's a, some teachers in particular, I could name certain books, uh, certain uh, broadcasters that they, they teach a lot of good information, but again, their conclusions are wrong because their conclusions are different than the doctrine expounded in scripture. And that's a big problem. That's a death penalty problem. And 99% uh, of the Ephraimite movement is still ensconced in this, in this, uh, in Asav's camp, basically. And so our big job is to break away, to identify not with Asav and not with Asav's traditions, but to identify with the Tanakh and with the Renewed Covenant. That's it. The written Torah of Moshe. That's our job. But the written Torah of Moshe calls for different things than the Messianic movement in general is willing to embrace. And that's a huge problem. That's a death penalty problem because that's not the faith once delivered for all the saints. So we got some great questions this week. So just to, just to give you some background on that, uh, we're going to actually spend some good time. In the, so these, these were two really illustrative questions. So uh, the first question we got was, and this, <laughs> the spelling uh, isn't the grab, could be phone typing, I'm not sure, but it says, isn't elders and deacons a system of the Nicolaitans? Okay, we'll take a look at that. It's, it's commanded in scripture. So isn't the system of elders and deacons, which is commanded in scripture, isn't that of the Nicolaitans and the Gentile pyramid system of control? Okay, uh, so we're going to take this like a genuine question because that's what it seems to be. Uh, we don't know who you are, so we're just going to we're going to dig in here. But it's part two of the question. So Yahusha, and that's a particular spelling propounded by a particular author who uh, also advocates disorganization. Again, taking scripture out of context or using one verse to explain away another verse, that those things just don't work. So I mean, not if we value our salvation, not if we value eternal life. He says, Yahusha rebu rebuked the sons of thunder's mother for asking if they could sit at the side of him in the kingdom to come. Okay, so again, I'm, I'm reaching way back to, you know, 1999, 2000, 2001, when I'm first being introduced to these, what are today widespread mainstream messianic teachings because an author is teaching a broader, easier road. And this is Ephraim's, you know, this is the same thing. When we left Israel, we, we could have, two or three weeks, we could have been home. You know what I mean? If we'd wanted to do it Yahweh's way. If we wanted to do it Yahweh's way, we never would have had to leave the garden. You know, <laughs> if we wanted to do things Yahweh's way, we would have never had to leave the garden. Uh, if we'd wanted to do things Yahweh's way, we could have gone straight from Egypt to Israel. And it's the same thing for Ephraim today. We're taking the long, slow, torturous, broad, easy road that goes to destruction. And we're trying to call out the 10% who want what Elohim is offering. Because the kingdom of heaven, it's a free invitation, but it's not free to belong. Certainly not. It's, it's, a, it's a grassroots movement. It's user powered and we are the users. So anyway, it has to be order and organization. There's a lot of, of course, that's not popular. <laughs> Why? Because if somebody, if Yahweh's going to say, obey my commandments and here's eternal life and Satan's going to whisper in your ear, did Elohim indeed, indeed say you need to obey his commandments? Did Elohim indeed say you need to do just like what the renewed covenant says to do? I ask this question of the messianic leaders and teachers all the time. It's like, if we're going to practice the faith that was delivered once for all the saints, shouldn't it look like the faith that was delivered once for all the saints? Just maybe. The kids file that away. So, uh, you know, great question. So, so Yeshua rebuked the sons of thunder's mother for asking if they could sit at the side of him in the kingdom to come. Okay, not exactly sure what point you're going at, but we'll hit that one next. So let's hit the first, let's hit the first question first. Uh, so first off, let's go to Strong's uh, Greek concordance, Renewed Covenant concordance, 3531. So Nikolai Tes, I, I don't speak Greek. <laughs> In a perfect world, we had 
all the time in the world, I, I probably would learn it, but it's not, not top priority, that's for sure. So from Greek 3532, a Nicolaite, that is an adherent of Nicolaus. Okay, so there's, uh, if we had more time, there's a whole history there. We could go into who was Nicolaus, and there's no, really not a lot known about Nicolaus, but anyway, let's just move forward. So we come here, look up to the root, because that's important. You need to look up, even if you don't like what you see, you need to look it up to the root. It's from Greek 35, 34, and 2004, victorious over the people. Okay, victory over the laity is the way I heard it put the first time. So again, Nicolaus was uh, reportedly a heretic. So uh, yeah, so we don't know that much about him. But if, so then, so then there are some people, myself included, who take the what would you call it? The language-based approach. You know, what what is the word meaning? Because all in Scripture, all names are prophetic. So Nicolaus, so taking victory over the laity, basically is what it means. So aren't these Scripture system based? Aren't these things? Aren't they a uh, uh, victory over the laity? It's like okay, wait. All right, so let's keep moving forward. So Logos also has a free Bible application. I'm going to get some liquid here. They have one for the PC. I still don't know how to use that. The one for the tablet is excellent. Uh, you can learn a lot that from that way. The research is excellent, but again, watch out for the conclusions because the conclusions are Trinitarian. So it says the Aramaic spelling of Nicolaitan could be rendered as let us eat. Alternately, the phrase uh, the Beleam, taken from Beleam, meaning he who consumes the people. Okay, He's eating the sheep. Okay, has been equated with the literal rendering of Nicolaitan, he overcomes the people or he consumes the people, victory over the laity. Just all those concepts are related. And who we're talking about, forgive my saying so, are all of the leaders and teachers who teach something other than the faith that was once delivered for all the saints. So I've met a lot of Messianic leaders and teachers out there, and I have to ask them, uh, brothers, if we're going to practice the faith that was delivered once for all the saints, and if we're going to operate the way the scripture says, uh, shouldn't it look like what scripture says? I never do get an answer to that question. It's very interesting. Okay, so the question is organization. I mean, and there's I've heard some some uh, some major messianic leaders talk against organization and promoting groups like the Tents of Abraham and these kind. You know, it's like, show me that in Scripture. Show me that in Scripture. And if you can't show me that in Scripture, are we into the traditions of men? So I, I really, I, under, I empathize with this question because a lot of people are listening to these broad, easy road evangelical, they're rogue ministers is what they are, basically. They're taking their good giftings and they're using them for their own benefits and purposes. They've got their own possessions. So the Levitical order was never supposed to have possessions. It's the same with the Melchizedekian priesthood. You don't own possessions. You, you live, you work to serve Yahweh, and you take what you need, but that's it. Everything else you give to his, you, you give to help you invest. It's a heavy investment cycle, continuous investment cycle. You give to help build his kingdom. That's what we're supposed to do. That shows a heart for Yeshua. So, and then these other ministers are like taking six figures, incomes, home, net. It's just like unbelievable. And the people support it. You know, it's kind of like, it's kind of like in the, <laughs> you know, when you go into a store, the grocery store, it's like all the real, like they say, all the real food is around the, the rim of the store. And there's aisle after aisle after aisle just filled with junk. You know, and stuff that's just not good for you. Boxed, packaged, preservatives, all this kind of, and it's more expensive to eat that way. Your health suffers. Now you're paying the doctor. So just, just a non, um, wow. Okay. So, um, Shemot or Exodus 18 verse 25, Moshe chose able men out of all Israel and made them heads over the people. Rulers over thousands, rulers over hundreds, rulers over fifties, and rulers over tens. Okay, question, brother. Okay, just, just to ask you, okay, disconnect from what you've heard other ministries say, okay? Disconnect from the broad, easy road ministers. Is this commandment Nicolaitan? 
okay, we're, we're reading the parasha each week. Okay, we're, we're, you know what I'm saying? We're supposed to be clean animals. Okay, so you're going to listen to the parasha and then you're going to compare it to the scripture in your reading and you're going to burp it up and you're going to chew on it. Someone's like, did that really match what that was? Forgive me for saying so. This is the only ministry I know of that we're trying to do things according to what the Renewed Covenant says to do. Everyone else is giving a traditions of men approach. Well, this is what the people will do, or this is what the people want, <laughs> or hey, Torah fans. I mean, you know, I mean, you have to, you have to be smarter than the wolf. Okay, so is this Nicolaitan? <laughs> Mark chapter six, Mark, I don't know, six, starting in verse 39. Then Yeshua commanded his disciples to make all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So the disciples ordered them. So everyone, they all sat down in ranks. Sounds like military structure in the hundreds and in fifties, because everything is done in an orderly fashion. You have to have leadership cadre and you have to have the people. That's how it is in Israel. Okay. Is that Nicolaitan? Think about what these ministers are teaching you, brethren. So here, let's come to Maase or Acts chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. It says, Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of a set-apart spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business of the third tithe, ministry to the widows, the poor, the orphan, uh, the strangers who are just trying to get established, so the the charity, we, so Ephraim's like, charity? No, 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 no. I made this money with my own right hand. So is this verse four, so that we can continue to give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word, the first tithe ministry. Okay, so that's the first tithe in verse four. That's the third tithe in verse three. And the second tithe is supposed to be managed by households. So that's how it's supposed to go. Are any of these other ministries teaching that? Okay. Oh, oh. and is this Nicolaitan? Were the disciples being Nicolaitan in chapter six? <laughs> Think carefully. So Titus chapter one and verse five, here's the acid test for you. For this reason, I left you in Crete that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. Okay, appoint elders. Okay, so if we think about this, <clears throat> you've got at least five, or, well, more like six levels of organization here. Okay, because first we know, first we know that the Apostle Yaakov in Jerusalem was the Nasi or the head for the organization, because then you had uh, Kepha sent to the circumcision and uh, Shaul sent to the uncircumcision. So then Shaul's commanding Timothy who's going to appoint the elders, who are going to appoint the deacons, who are there to serve the needs of the people and the ministers. So you've got at least, you've got at least six levels of organization there. Okay. Are your ministries preaching six levels of organization? <laughs> and would it be Nicolaitan if they were? <laughs> so 1 Timothy to, uh, chapter 3 and verse 1, this is a faithful saying. Okay, we do we believe our Bibles. Do we believe what the Bible says? If a man desires the position of an elder, okay, in Hebrew, zakan, as a bearded one, but in the other language, a bishop or an overseer, he desires a good work. Okay, so is this Nicolaitan? <laughs> Listen, uh, so it's this is just one of those things. We, as a people, we have to ask ourselves, I, I remember when I first started in the Messianic movement, it was just, that's what it was. It was just like, well, there's, <laughs> there were these ministries and they were teaching these things. And it's like, well, how does it match up with this? And you write them and you, a question, you never get an answer. So, you know, um, it's your family. Uh, and well, that's the difference actually. <laughs> In, in the exodus from Egypt, if the parents disobeyed, the children at least still got to go into the land. But this time, if you're not right, you're not coming home. So uh, whoever you are uh, in your family, take, this, take, take Yeshua's words to heart. And if the rest of your family doesn't get it, help them to understand. Children, if your parents don't understand, help them to understand. Okay, so... 
let's come back to the question. So isn't the system of elders and deacons a system of the Nicolaitans? It's like, I, I, don't, I don't understand your question, brother. Uh, and isn't that a Gentile pyramidal system of control? Okay, uh, good question. So just to close the question out, and I couldn't find the slide. It's, uh, things are so busy here. It's always hard to explain how busy. We've just got a mountain that's got to get moved into the sea. So uh, keep praying with us for the Father to send out workers into his harvest in all languages and all nations. But the difference is, so you see the, the top-down pyramidal system of control okay, versus the bottom up if you take the tree shape. And I, I couldn't find the slide on short notice, but uh, if you consider Yeshua as the root, then you have the trunk, which is the Beit Din Gadol, with the Nasi in charge of the Beit Din Gadol. Then you have the elders who support the local congregations. They have the deacons, which are the twigs. And then you have the leaves of the branches, which are the people. So it's the question is, it's a great question, but if we follow that logically through to its logical conclusion, the, the ultimate question becomes, who's serving who? <laughs> you know, are, are, are we here to serve him or is he here to serve us? So are, you know, do the strong serve the weak or do the strong take advantage of the weak? So in the Babylonian hierarchical system, you have the strong, the, the power elites, Zira and Asav in depending on what we're talking about, but Zira and Asav are controlling everything on down. And then you have uh, <laughs> the, the, the poor oppressed masses. So, and then we talk about that in the uh, Revelation series, and you've got the split between Asav and, or we'll talk about that, yeah, in, in other places, between Ephraim and Ishmael, but let's not unpack that here. And then what Yeshua is propounding is if you are strong in your faith, you support others who are weak in their faith. So if you are strong in your faith like you think you are, then you should work at building your local congregation. You should begin by serving as a deacon and you should progress from there to eldership. Okay, it's, it's, it, he desires a good work. Okay, so let's, let's jump to the second part of this question. He says then, now Yahusha, again, that's a fossilized name. So Yahusha rebuked the sons of thunder's mother for asking him if they could sit at the side of him in the kingdom to come. Okay, good question. I understand a lot of people who follow uh, that particular author, uh, who have learned from, learned wrong traditions from that particular author. Uh, I can understand a lot of people have this same question. So let's that's what I was going to talk about. Get my slides in mixed order. We are doing our best to bring you our best. That's the slide I was talking about. That's your that's your elitist Babylonian mystery Babylonian pyramid with Asav and or Zira at the top, depending on what we're talking about. And then going on down, we'll talk about that in other places. I couldn't find the slide quickly. So let's just keep going. Okay, there we go. Matit Yahu or Matthew chapter 20 and verse 20. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to him with her sons, kneeling down and asking something from him, and trying to get something for ourselves. 21, and he said to her, what do you wish? So she said to him, grant that these two sons of mine may sit, one on your right hand and the other on your left in your kingdom. Okay, doesn't say why it would work for Yahweh. We'll talk about that later in the presentation. Okay, she just wants something for her DNA, for her seed line. So verse 22, Yeshua answered and said, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink and be immersed with the immersion that I am immersed with? And they said to him, we are able. Uh, so he said to them, verse 23, you will indeed drink my cup and be immersed with the immersion that I am immersed with, but to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it is prepared by my father. Okay, so now, is that Nicolaitan if the Father has prepared a place on the right or the left hand of Yeshua? 
<laughs> is that Nicolaitan, if the father Yahweh has his own order, it ba meritocracy basically is what it is. He gives us the disposition, but we have to pray to be used. We have to make ourselves available. We have to welcome the spirit in, make sure she's comfortable or she'll leave. <laughs> is that Nicolaitan? Okay. Uh, you know, we also have renewed covenant injunctions for First Corinthians According to Team Aleph, chapter 14 and verse 40, let all things be done decently and in order. Okay, is that Nicolaitan? Because there's a lot of ministers out there. They are preaching full-on disorganization. It's like, no, you don't have to do what the Rear Covenant says. Just buy my books and tapes. It's like, you know, <laughs> it's the wolf. It's the total, it's the wolf. It's the false shepherd. It's the dumb, greedy dog that does not know how to bark. That's what it is. It's these people, it's these rogue ministers. They're taking their giftings and they're, they're using them for themselves. So instead of taking the money and pooling it so we could fund orphanages, so we could fund schools, so we could start things, they're taking the money home and they're putting it in their pocket and they're saying, well, the worker is worthy of his hire. <laughs> oh, I see. So that's why the worker can depart from the letter of scripture. Oh, he's, he's still a valid minister. Uh-huh, and he can get married and divorced and still be a minister. Uh-huh, okay, yeah, 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 I see. He's still a good example to the flock. Uh, I see, mm -hmm. no. Um, okay, coming back to Scripture, <clears throat> Yehezkel, Ezekiel, chapter 37, verse 16 says, As for you, son of man, take a stick and write for yourself on it. Okay, that's, we'll take a look at the word stick. So this is right for one stick for Judah and for the children of Israel, his companions. So the children of Israel, we'll talk about that in the documentary series, the history section. So there are many of the northern tribes are presently accompanying Judah and good for them because they defected at the time when King Jeroboam, uh, well, when we went astray into golden calf worship with King Jeroboam. Okay, so Judah's already formed a stick. Okay, then take a, that's why they have a country. Ephraim has not yet formed a stick. That's why Ephraim does not have a homeland. Okay, Ephraim doesn't understand what it means to be a nation. Ephraim needs to take seriously the concept of a nation. Okay, because then it says, then take another stick and write on it. For Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel, his companions. And we could talk about this. Shalom and welcome. We're coming back to the... Uh, after the transmission fell, we're just going to come back. So I'm backing up a couple of slides, and we're just going to start again and splice them together. And uh, so sorry about the break. Uh, please pray for Yahweh's will that we'll have stable internet and stable electric that we can provide you with the best, because we want to bring you our best uh, for his son. So let's jump back to Yehezkel or Ezekiel chapter 37 and verse 16. And here we have it helps if I put it up on screen. So here we have, we're talking about the stick of Judah and the two sticks coming together, Judah and Joseph coming together in these end times. And as we have already mentioned, the th Judah has already formed this stick. So the first part is done. Judah formed an organization. That's why they have a country. So Ephraim, <laughs> if you read the whole prophecy in context, we have to form a nation before we get to come home. And that's what the Great Commission is, is it's nation building. It's nation formation. So it's so important. People don't understand. So uh, we take a look at this word, etz. Very important word, simple word, easy to look over. Strong's Concordance, Hebrew, 6086. Etz, it's from 6095, but it means a tree, meaning from its firmness. Uh, and so... Hence, you get wood. You get wood from a firm tree. It has something has to have a, like a, a heavy trunk, so you can get wood, uh, but you know, a gallows or a pine, a plank, staff, a stock, timber, lumber, tree, wood, all these kinds of things. But this concept of firmness. Now, I don't have any. I don't have an actual stick here. I guess I, have, I didn't get time to rehearse. But uh, so this is the. You know, this is a bullet level. But it has firmness, so you can you can it all moves together as one thing, right? It's not it's uh, as opposed to a bunch of sawdust or a bunch of you know a bunch of splinters everywhere, okay? Or you know a pile of of wood pulp. It's not the same thing. 
This is something has to be together and typically it has order and structure to it. Okay, now how can Ephraim, or how can Joseph make a stick of Joseph in the hand of Ephraim without any order and without any organization? So there's all these ministries. They just they they completely you know pasar por alto. They they, just compl- they overstep. They sidestep. They skirt around. You know, Acts 15. Okay, it's the requirement. You have to forswear from the four abominations and enter into the synagogue environment. We're going to call ours the, it's a, a Beit Mikra, a house of what is read, meaning scripture. That's the the modern Hebrew word they use. If you want to go into a house where scripture is read, that's called a Beit Mikra. We're updating everything. We're going to replace the word synagogue with Beit Mikra. So Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 through 22, tells us we need to operate on a single doctrine, which is his. Jude verse 3, we need to be... Even though we're all saved, it's still necessary, it's still needful to practice the original halakha. There's no getting around it. Uh, so people want to get around it. I'm going to get some liquid. Anyway, everyone knows. We've talked all about it before. Everyone knows that these are the requirements. And Nazarene Israel is preaching the requirements. And where are these other ministries? What are, what are they doing? So uh, what they're doing is they're preaching against order and organization because that cuts into their personal take-home profits. That's what they're doing. If you think about it, if you follow the money trail. So is that, you know, is, is structure, order, and organization bad? Or is it just wrong structure, order, and organization that is bad? Let's take a look at what Yahweh says. Yirmiyahu, or Jeremiah 30 and verse 21 says, Their nobles shall be from among them, and their governor shall come from their midst. There's order, there's structure, there's organization. Then I will cause him to draw near, and he shall approach me. For who is this who pledged his heart to approach me? Says Yahweh. He likes that. Yahweh loves that. Here we're going to see in the Haftarah portion, Yehezkel or Ezekiel, chapter 44 and verse 3, as for the prince, that's the Nasi, because he is the Nasi, he may sit in the vestibule to eat bread before Yahweh. He shall enter by way of the vestibule of the gateway and go out the same way. We don't have time to unpack the prince's role here, the Nasi's role, but it's very extensive. There's several chapters on it. It is translated as prince. It means something more like the exalted one or the yeah the, the exalted one you're properly an exalted one or one that's lifted up because when you go through uh, when you go through nisuin the when the bride is taken she's lifted up she's carried aloft that's nisuin okay and this is the nasi so it's the same idea of being lifted up by their brethren okay so yeah, and we had another question that I spent a lot of time in prayer this week, just trying to reconnect to the things that I was taught a long time ago in, in 1999, 2000, 2001, was first studying things out and some of the bad teaching that was out there. And some, and you know, they connected this week in prayer that, yeah, there's a reason those ministers are very popular, is that they preach a broad, easy road. That isn't exactly the same thing as what Scripture says to do. Jude 3, it, yet it's still necessary to practice the faith that was delivered once for all the saints. It's still necessary to walk as Yeshua walked, keeping his halakha, his standards, his goals. What's he trying to do? He's trying to establish his Father's kingdom, what we messed up back in the garden. He's trying to bring us back there. So we got this second question that when I prayed about it, it's like, you know, this is, this is really related. So I want to honor this question just because there's a lot of bad teaching out there. So we got this question, seems sincere. So the Vatican worships Lucifer. I mean, <laughs> they do. Uh, they had a high mass singing in Latin, worshiping Lucifer. We'll take a look at it in just a second. So why do we as a people have anything to do with the Catholic or universal church? And first, let's let's take a look at that video. So. Flamma seius, Lucifer matut 
continus in veniat. Ive in quam lucifer quin escito casum, Christus filius tus, qui regressus ab inferis, humano generis serenus iluxit, et tecum vivit et regnat, in secula seculorum. Amen. Okay, so a uh, great question. I think it's a great question. Okay, it's a, it's a group of people, their leaders are misleading them to worship Lucifer. Okay, now, uh, you know, there's people in this town, I'm sure, are going to start watching the broadcast, and we want to reach out to them with the truth. Typically, they'll probably watch the Spanish broadcast. My brother Mihael is doing a great job. So, but why do we as a people want to have anything to do with this Catholic or universal church? And, and I guess that's, you know, it's really a great question, but uh, I think what it really has to do with the most is pleasing our husband, Yeshua, and what does he want? And what he wants is to please his father, Yahweh. And what does he want? He wants us to be the good gardening family that loves each other and takes care of his planet so that together we can hear and obey his voice. That's what he wants. And Yeshua is trying to get us back there. And the only way to do that is to submit to his spirit, and we like that part, and also to submit to his program. <laughs> His program, yeah, meaning we have to enter in. So that's been, <laughs> I looked around, I looked around when I first got saved, I looked around and around for a ministry that was teaching entering in and I couldn't find one. And I, I looked around and around for a ministry that that they would could answer my questions, you know, because autistic people, if you have a question, you, you're not, you can't let it go. You just, it doesn't, it doesn't work that way for autistic people. So if you can't answer my questions about the Bible, what else are you teaching wrong? You know, I, mean, I don't understand. If it doesn't match scripture, what are we doing here? You know what I mean? So uh, I just ended up in ministry because I, I looked back then, I, was, I thought I was looking for someone to apprentice with. The correct word would have been disciple. Um, you know, that Judah doesn't have any problem with this concept of imitating the Mashiach or imitating their rabbi. This, Judah, Judah lives and breathes this. So here we have the ex-Pharisee Shaul, the ex-Haredi Shaul, Corinthian Aleph, uh, 11 in verse 1. He says, imitate me just as I also imitate Mashiach Nagid. Okay, so the rabbis, you know, that, I mean, that's what the Orthodox do. They, they imitate their rabbis. So that's, that's they understand this concept. Uh, Ephraim, sad to say, doesn't understand this concept. Uh, one of the things we came out of Asav's house. So Asav adores Yeshua, okay, but but Asav doesn't imitate Yeshua. Okay, and they have a they have a priesthood that teaches something other than imitating Yeshua. So like we talked about uh, last week, I didn't copy the slide across. It's just you know everything is it's hard to explain how busy it is here. But uh, the Pope opened the door for other ministries. Okay, so. Why would we not want to take that opportunity? I, I don't understand that. Would, would Yeshua not go preach where he was uh, asked to preach? Would Shaul not go preach where he was asked to preach? I, I, don't, I don't understand that question, so I'm hoping you can refine it for us perhaps in the comments. Uh, but so Asav, okay, they adore Yeshua, but they don't try to imitate Yeshua. And this is one of the things about coming out of Asaph's house. We have to come out of Asaph's traditions. We have to come out of Asaph's ways. So we have to not just adore Yeshua. That's great to adore Yeshua, but can't stop there. Okay, we have to imitate Yeshua. That's what we're called to do. If you want to be Joseph or Ephraim, white horse, white horse Christianity, not pink horse, not tainted pink. Okay, we have to imitate Yeshua. We have to do our very best. When we read something, we don't, if we don't like it, <laughs> we better read it again until we do like it. 
So, you know, we're going to imitate Yeshua, Luca or Luke chapter 11, verse 37. And as he spoke, a certain Pharisee asked Yeshua if he would come in and dine with him. Someone wants to hear the word. What did Yeshua do? He went in and sat down to eat. Okay, so it's like, I, I, I do understand the question. I do understand the question. Uh, you know, why would we want, because so what, what we don't want to do, what we don't want to do, and Judah has a, a lot of, well, this is perfectly encapsulated. So, you know, you just stay away from people who are of another faith, because why? Because first your children become your become friends and then you get married. So that's basically how it goes. So you have to, you have to live in community with others of like mind and others of like faith so you can all hold each other accountable. And for the Messianic movement, there's just no accountability. There's no accountability to the word. There's no congregational discipline, nothing like that, because it's just what the people want, it's, which is Red Horse, which is Asaph. So, which is why there's 28,000 different denominations or whatever it is. So it says, as he spoke, a certain, most of them Protestant, as he spoke, a certain Pharisee asked Yeshua to come in and dine with him. Well, that's, a, that's an honor in Hebrew culture. So you're going to go in and talk. So he went in and sat down to eat. Okay, well, uh, <laughs> you know, is that bad? I mean, Yeshayahu or Isaiah 52 and verse 7 says, how beautiful, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. Isn't that what Yeshua did when he went in to eat? Okay, who proclaims peace, who brings glad tidings of good things, who proclaims salvation, who says to Zion, your Elohim reigns. Okay, the thing we need to get here, how, how beautiful are the feet of those who are doing these things to bring the message to the people? I mean, couldn't Yeshua have just said, I'm saved? <laughs> Who cares about this Pharisee? He's his fellow Jew. So Asav is our cousin, but there's a lot of Eph there's Ephraimites in every country. Isn't it our job to help find them? Okay, so Romans 10 and verse 14, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? So I guess uh, if we throw that verse out, I guess it, if we, <laughs> you know, we, we could start turning down offers to come in and preach. You know, it's, I mean, I got to tell you, it's like uh, there's a big difference between, between the house, between uh, the Anglos and the Latinos. So, I mean, we're being invited in to come minister the word. And this is huge. It's just enormous. And, and so uh, we're looking for those who, as the brother Judah would say, they're the fallen sparks of Abraham. So we'll talk about that some other time. But, but they've got an Abrahamic spark, whether they're found in Islam, whether they're found in Esau, or Ishmael, Esau. Maybe there's even some in Ephraim. You know, this, these are where people are. So we have to go. We have to go where the people are. If, you know, you have to, you have to, if you're going to preach, you're going to teach, you have to go where the people are. We've got an invitation. It's like, are we supposed to not walk through that door that Yahweh has just opened? I, I don't understand. It was kind of like, now we have a questions. So I hope people will please answer, you know, respond to that in the, in the, in the, in the comments. So here, Shaul, Romans, Romim 11, starting in verse 13, he says, for I speak to you Gentiles. He's talking to us. He's talking to Joseph. He's talking to Ephraim. We didn't know. I mean, when we were just getting, at first, we, we didn't know we were Joseph. We didn't know we were Ephraim. Shaul knew it. He didn't spell it out for us, but you can see everything here. For I speak to you Josephite Gentiles, inasmuch as I am a shaliach, I'm an apostle, I'm a sent one, to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry to you Gentiles, if by any means I may provoke to jealousy those who are my flesh and save some of them, help them to come into submission with the Spirit as well. So uh, this was Shaul's heart. Is it our heart? So let's, let's look at Yeshua's parables. It tells us Yeshua's heart. Luke chapter 18, starting in verse 10. 
It says, two men went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other was a tax collector. And the Pharisee stood and he prayed like this. He prayed thus with himself. Elohim, I thank you that I am not like other men. I'm not an extortioner. I'm not unjust. I'm not an adulterer. And I'm also not as this tax collector. So I'm superior. I'm better than this man. I don't need to reach this man. I'm better than this man. Verse 12, I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. So you're doing things. This is, could be a verse for Judah as well. Uh, you know, you, you're doing all the right things, but somehow you're not quite doing the right thing. But yet you're proud of what you're doing and you consider yourself better than someone else. Okay, verse 13, whereas the tax collector standing far off, he wouldn't even raise his eyes to heaven, but he beat his breast saying, Elohim, be merciful to me, a sinner. So, oh, I'll keep reading. Verse 14, I tell you, this man, the one who humbled himself, this is the one who went down justified rather than the other one, the one who thought he was great. Okay, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. You know, I know these are difficult words to hear, uh, but I think it's indicative of what people can get taught on the broad, easy road if they don't watch out, if they're not careful. Okay, because there's a lot of people preaching and teaching a lot of things, and you have to go through your word and you have to check it out. That's why we wrote studies. So people can go through and check it out and make sure, yep, this is what Scripture says, or if it, that's not what Scripture says, let us know. Because we don't want to preach. It's not that we're right. It's we want to be found preaching and teaching what is right. So if you find a genuine, if you've read the study and read it twice and you still find a genuine issue with it, let us know. But, uh, you know, people need to be so careful. I mean... It doesn't matter that we're in these last days. We always need to be careful to be found doing what's in Scripture. But especially in these last days, if you want to survive, if you want your children to survive, we need to be found doing the right thing. And it's not a joke. So Yeshua tells us in Yohanan or John chapter 7 and verse 17, he says, if anyone wills to do his father's will, then he shall know concerning the doctrine, whether the doctrine is from Elohim or whether he's just talking amiss and he's speaking on his own authority as a human. Okay, so if it's genuinely prophetically based, he heard it from Elohim and he's speaking it forth as prophetic or ap and apostolic. Okay, or if he's just talking junk. There's false prophets as well as good ones. But here's the thing. If anyone wills to do his will, what is his will? Okay, his will is to have this single family of man working together to take care of each other so that together we can take care of his planet and listen to him. That's what he wants. That's what he's always wanted. He still wants it. That's what his son is coming to get us to turn back and do. That's the whole thing. So what difference does it make? Well, if you know what his will is, that he wants a single family of man living together, obeying his voice and all his written commandments, statutes, judgments, his commandments, statutes, judgments, then you're going to know. Because because if, if you understand what Yahweh said, and if you're listening in the Spirit, because you want to do his will, then you're going to be able to hear in the Spirit. Okay, well... Uh, <laughs> I'm just trying for the nicest possible way to say this. Uh, if, if this is a person who is just brand new to the movement, okay, I don't know who you are. I don't, I don't know your name. Uh, but if, if you're brand new to Nazarene Israel and you've been with Nazarene Israel less than six months, less than a year, uh, then, you know, praise Yahweh. You, you're doing good. You know, that's a, that's a good question to ask. Okay. But if you're a person who's been following Nazarene Israel for some time, now and you're still asking 
effectively, why do we need to worry about Asaph? Why do we need to worry about Ishmael? Why do we need to worry about Judah? Why do we need to worry about Manasseh? Why do I really need to worry about the poor? I mean, this is, <laughs> this is a very Yaphethite attitude. You know, we'll talk about that in the Abraham Accords series. Uh, Israel is of Shem. Shem is very family oriented. So Yapheth has big, 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 big problems with community orientation. We'll talk about that in the Abraham Accords series. Uh, helping your family and helping your community and knitting the whole family and community together is one. These are all very important things in Shemite culture. So if we have this heart and if we have Yeshua's spirit and if we're listening to Yeshua's spirit, Yeshua's spirit is going to let us know we're going to be able to hear, yes, this is right. This is what the spirit wants. And it's going to lead toward that single family unified together. It's not going to say, who cares about Asaph? It's not going to say, who cares about, you know, someone else? That's, that's not an attitude that Elohim likes. So, Yohanan or John, chapter 7 and verse 35 then the Jews said among themselves, they said, where does he intend to go? So Yeshua said he has other sheep. He says, where does he intend to go that we shall not find him? Does he intend to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and to teach the Greeks? And that's exactly what he came to do on his first trip. So Yeshua tells us in Yohanan or John chapter 17, starting in verse 20, he says, I do not pray for these alone. But all, so he's not just praying for the 12, and aren't we glad? He says, but I'm also praying for those who will believe in me through their word. So doesn't that imply that they then had to go forth and preach the word? How beautiful are the feet of those who obey him in that? Verse 21, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I am in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. It's his desire that the world knows the truth about Yeshua. So how can they hear without a preacher? And isn't that our job? Oh, if we're paying attention to the Renewed Covenant. Okay, I know there's a lot of preachers out there, a lot of teachers that aren't. I've met rabbis, I've met pastors. They don't, they don't care to match with the Renewed Covenant. Masse or Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, Yeshua tells us, but you shall receive power when the set-apart spirit has come upon you. And if you haven't received the set-apart spirit, ask, seek, and knock. Keep knocking. Keep knocking until you get it. Keep, keep asking. Keep seeking. Keep listening. Keep seeking his face. Because this, this is the most important thing in your life is are you filled with his spirit? Are you obeying the spirit? Have you handed over the steering wheel and keys? And once you do that, then with his spirit, then you can be witnesses to him, not only in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, but also to the ends of the earth. How many people do we have who are uh, basically comfortable with their lifestyle? living in the land of Babylon, which scripture says not to do. Uh, and Yahweh's not really top priority. Yahweh's kind of a hobby they go to on Sabbath and feasts, but not really an all-consuming lifestyle with them. So other cultures, I mean, this is just amazing. Other people live their faiths. You know, does, does Ephraim live his faith? Okay, so in Maaseh or Acts chapter 17 and verse 22, Shaul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, the Greeks, which is whom Yeshua said, we're, that, that's, where you, that's where we went to. We had to go call back lost Joseph. That's our job. It lost Joseph. And we also have, we'll see, there was all, basically remnants of all 12 tribes. So then Shaul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. Okay, verse 23. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription. To the unknown Elohim, the unknown God, 
Therefore, the one whom you proclaim without knowing him, I proclaim to you. So what he's doing is he's, he's bringing them the truth. He's using an open door to bring them the truth. Okay, are we all doing this? Now, we all have an individual ministry responsibility. Obviously, we are all to witness our faith primarily by how we live. Okay, witness the word. If necessary, speak words. Okay, primarily the way we live. We're listening for his voice. We're seeking his face. We're waiting on him. That's what we're supposed to be doing. We're servants. We're supposed to wait on him and his voice. So are we doing that? Okay, if we are, then we're going to know that we have a job and we have a great big responsibility, like Shaul says in Romans chapter 10 and verse 14. Okay, how shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? Okay, Asaph doesn't know. Asaph got taught the wrong thing. Do we have no compassion on them because they got taught the wrong thing? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? So no one told them, oh, you have to not just adore Yeshua, you have to imitate Yeshua. No one told them. And then we just said, no, you just adore him, and then you go off and do what you want. As long as you adore him, you're holy. Adore And adore this statue, especially Miriam, adore this statue, which is prohibited by the written Torah. But no one told them. We were doing this only up to a little bit more than 500 years ago with the Protestant Reformation. We were the same. Okay, do we, do we have no compassion? Really, I mean, when it comes right down to it, Esau actually did us a great big favor because uh, we were lost in paganism. We were worshiping snakes and pigs and uh, whatever. Okay, well, they got it to where we, we were worshiping demons. So now in the Catholic Church, you're only lighting candles. Okay, you're not, it's, 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 a, it's a step. Do people understand it's a step? And then the Protestant Reformation was another step. And then the, the Messianic movement was yet another step. Ephraimite movement, another step. Okay, but someone has to expose you to these. I mean, what should I do? Should I say, like, I have my faith, so I'm done? Oh, I guess we'll close the transmission. The, 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 where, 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 that's a very Yephathite question. Where is the love for your fellow man? Where is, I don't, I don't get it. I, I don't understand. Uh, you know, how shall they hear without a preacher? And if we who claim his name don't want to put his message, his word in front of other people, oh, because we've already got ours. So who cares about anyone else? Wow. Uh, I'm in prayer for the person for the who asked this question, and the vast majority of Ephraim who are lost with the same issues, same problems, because of certain teachers who teach wrong things. And it's like, well, we're we're good. <laughs> hey, Torah fans, we're good. Kepha Bet or Second Peter chapter three and verse nine. Yahweh, no matter what Ephraim does, no matter what Judah does. No matter what Levy says, Yahweh is not slack concerning his promises and his prophecies, as some would count slackness. But he is long-suffering toward us. He's not willing that any should perish. Okay, so if we will to do his will, then we shall know concerning the doctrine. Okay, Yahweh is not willing that any should perish. So shouldn't that be our heart as well? if we want to fit in, in the day of the wedding. But what Yahweh wants is that all should come to repentance. He wants all of fallen Adam to repent and come back to him. And that's what Yeshua came to do, is he came to bring us back to the written Torah of Moshe, to turn away from the traditions of men, to turn away from the Tachanot and Masim, to turn away from the Zugot pairs, and to turn back to Yahweh's word. That's what he came to do. Plus, he also came to show us how to walk out the Torah of Moshe. That's another thing that he did. Okay, now, so in this section, we're going to talk about the functions of the Levitical priesthood. Okay, so in the Torah portion. Now, there was a lot. 
want to do a lot with the questions because those are some really good questions. And really, I think it speaks to the, uh, where a lot of people have been mistaught and a lot of people might need to read scripture again and update themselves. Okay. But as we're reading scripture, we're going through the parashiot, we see the functions of the Levitical priesthood. Okay, now just recapping, okay, the, the tabernacle was effectively a portable Garden of Eden restaurant. Okay, there's a lot of rituals that are involved with that. So the, one of the primary jobs of the Levitical priesthood, Levi, was to perform those commanded rituals. Also, there were maintenance and security tasks. Get some liquid. And point three is very important. The priesthood is, has the job of teaching Yahweh's people the difference between the set apart, what Yahweh says is set apart, and the profane. Okay, and also, in addition to that, they were to render righteous judgments in disputes. And we're going to take a look at that. Okay, we're going to come back to this later. Let's just take a look at some examples. You have skill 44 in verse 23 and they shall teach my people the difference between the Kodesh, the set apart, and the whole, between Kodesh and whole, and cause them to discern between the Tameh and the Tahor, between the unclean and the clean. That's the priesthood's job. Okay, well, that's Levi's job. We have the principles and precepts. That's also the job for the order of Melchizedek. It's an active job. It's got to be done. Uh, chapter 44 and verse 24. In controversy, we'll see this in the Haftar section. In controversy, they shall stand as judges and judge it according to my judgments, not the Talmud, but the Tanakh. And they shall keep my laws, okay? not the Talmud, but the Torah Moshe, and my statutes in all of my appointed meetings, and they shall set my Sabbaths apart. Okay, so now let's come to the actual commandment. We're going to zero in. We're going to dive in on the text. So Vikra or Leviticus, chapter 22, starting in verse 31. Therefore, you shall keep my commandments, meaning obey and perform them. Okay, it means we can't just read it, Ephraim. We actually have to do them. Okay, Judah, it means you can't replace them. Verse 32. You shall not profane my set-apart name, also not profane it by how we live. How many people have, it's like, they're, they're claiming Yeshua's name, but they're behaving like the devil. You know, they, they don't have love for their brothers in their hearts. He says, you shall not profane my set-apart name, not verbally, not through your actions, not by taking my name and then disobeying my commandments, by being a harlot. He says, but I will be set apart among the children of Israel, and I am Yahweh who sanctifies you or sets you apart. So, Vaikra or Leviticus 23, starting in verse 1, Yahweh spoke to Moshe saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, The feasts of Yahweh, which you shall proclaim to be set apart rehearsals, Mikre Kodesh, these are my feasts. And then he goes to uh, list all the feasts, and then we have the, our written study on the website is the Torah calendar. You can also order copies at cost on Amazon.com. We also have a lot of videos on the website. Just go to the search bar and whatever you're looking for. But coming back to the the Torah portion of the parasha, so Vaikra or Leviticus 24 in verse 22. It says, you shall have the same Torah for the stranger, meaning returning Joseph, returning Ephraim, returning Israel, the lost 10 tribes that Yeshua says he came for. You have the same Torah for them and for one from your own country. For I am Yahweh your Elohim. So it's like Ephraim's got problems with this, but Judah has problems with this also. So in marked well, a complete contrast to what Yahweh says in the Torah. Now let's come to the Wikipedia article on Noahidism. So it tells us Noahidism, or the B'nai Noach, the so-called sons of Noah, is a monotheistic Jewish religious movement aimed at non-Jews. And the Talmud is very extensive on this. 
based upon the seven laws of Noah, which is based upon the premise that Joseph no longer lives. And here's the point, and their traditional interpretations within Orthodox Judaism. So traditional interpretations of the Tanakh is not the same thing as the Tanakh in this case, in the case of the Talmud, sad to say. Now behind my picture, let's just switch over here. So the rainbow is the unofficial symbol of Noahidism. Really? <clears throat> yeah, Noahidism and the LGBTQ plus alphabet movement. Uh, allegedly recalling the Genesis flood narrative in which a rainbow appeared to Noah after the flood. Okay, well, that's lovely. It's not what Yahweh says to do. Okay, now let's come here to the Safaria website, Tractate Sanhedrin 58b, the backside of the 58th leaf or folio or page, you might say. It says, and Resh Lakish says, a Gentile who observed Shabbat, talking about all Joseph, all Ephraim, is liable to receive the death penalty. As it is stated, and day and night shall not cease. I'm just taking that completely out of context. Just cherry pick something you want, make it up. Genesis 8 and 23, which literally means, he's saying, and day and night they shall not rest, meaning returning Joseph and Ephraim and Esau and Ishmael and whoever else they take as slaves. And it continues there. It says, this is interpreted... <clears throat> This is interpreted homiletically to mean that the descendants of Noah, meaning returning Gentile Joseph and Ephraim, may not take a day of rest. No Shabbat. Okay, And their master said, 57a, that their prohibition is their death penalty, meaning the prohibition for, uh, with the prohibition with regards to the descendants of Noah is grounds to execute them. That's completely the opposite of what Yahweh says. It continues, uh, Sanhedrin 59a, the front side of page or leaf or folio 59, and Rabbi Yohanan says, a Gentile who engages in Torah study, such as everyone watching this video, is liable to receive the death penalty. As it is stated, Moses gave Judah the law and not Joseph, basically. So, uh, brothers, uh, Levi, Judah, how is this the same as Yahweh's commandment? So, Od Yosef Hai, and it says, you shall have the same Torah for the returning Gentile Josephite or Ephraimite and for one from your own country, for I am Yahweh your Elohim. So we can't come home until, until the, you guys go back to Tanakh. He says, it's not possible for us to come home at this point in time. Okay, so now we come to our Haftarah prophetic portion, and we're going to see an enigmatic figure called the Nasi of Ezekiel's temple, and we're going to take a look in depth, and we're going to see the parallels between what the principles and the precepts and the parallels between what's going on in Ezekiel's temple with the Nasi with what's going on in Yeshua's renewed order of Melchizedek, kings and priests. Okay, now we come to, we arrive at Ezekiel, Yehezkel, chapter 40, we're starting to talk about what we call the millennial temple. You know, this is not the next temple coming up. And the next temple, the third temple, that'll be a, a completely different temple. This is the fourth temple. This comes after the tribulation, after Armageddon. That's when this one comes. Okay. So there's going to be a temple. We come to chapter 44 and talking all through about the temple and the dimensions, the specifications, and everything is prophetic. There's shadow pictures in all of it. So then you've got Yehezkel, chapter 44 and verse 3. Now it says, and as for the Nasi, as for the, the prince, because he is the Nasi, he may sit in the vestibule to eat bread before Yahweh, and he shall enter by way of the vestibule, the gateway, and go out the same way. Okay, it's got various things that the Nasi will do. <clears throat> and again, the Nasi is an exalted one. So he's, he's lifted up. Like Nisuin is when the bride is carried to her new home in her groom's father's house. So, but it's translated as prince or ruler properly, it's someone who's lifted up. Okay, now, this is advanced teaching here. So th there's, there are three main offices in scripture, plus there's a few more. We're only with two more here. Okay, so the first is you have the king, the priest, and the prophet. Okay, everyone knows that. And then you have the anointed judge, and then you have also 
the Nasi, and there's other leaders mentioned in scripture. But the king, that's the temporal world. That's the physical world. That's warfare. So it's lawyers, guns, money. That's his realm. So what a prime minister or a president does, uh, that's basically the kingship domain or the material, the temporal domain. Now, the priest, <clears throat> the king leads the temporal army. The priest effectively leads the spiritual army. The priest, yeah, I sort of, uh, we talk about how it's a portable Garden of Eden restaurant and they're the wait staff. It's a very important wait staff. These rituals, they show something to Yahweh that we care enough to do them according to what he says. Uh, the ritual services are very important. There's also a teaching role. And also, as we saw before, they also have a role to stand and judge disputes. So that's very important. Then you have the prophet, and the prophet is a listener. He basically makes himself an, an, an antenna, and he's listening for Yahweh's words so he can speak Yahweh's words to the nation. So that those who love Yahweh enough, so love Yahweh more than they love the world, they will survive. Well, then you also have what's called the anointed judge. Now, a good example of an anointed judge would be Shemuel, the, sort of the Ephraimite priest. There's also Gideon, uh, David, uh, and particularly a judge has to do something new. They're going to they're going to establish something uh, new. There's going to be a change of direction, such as with the tabernacle of David. And now also shaliachim, or we're talking genuine, real apostles here, the true servant kind. Uh, those are also, they're a type of a, of a renewed covenant anointed judge. There just has to be order between them. They all have to unify on the single foundation of apostles and prophets, or else they're not true apostles, but false ones. Okay, and now we're going to talk about the nasi. It's kind of an interesting special category. So, Yehezkel 44 and verse 5. Now, this is, we got a lot for Ephraim here. Yeah, there's been a lot of bad teaching. A lot of things have said, uh, have been said in the house of Ephraim. Uh, we need to forget, just stick the fire hose in one ear, just flush man's traditions on out, and let's reprogram ourselves according to Yahweh's word. Not according to our traditions, not according to what mom and dad told us, not according to what your rabbi told you, nothing like that. Okay, not man's traditions, not what seems good and right in our own eyes. Okay, this is for both houses, but it just brings Ephraim to mind completely. Yahweh said to me, son of man, mark well, see with your eyes and hear with your ears all that I say to you concerning all the ordinances of the house of Yahweh and all of its laws. We're talking in context, the fourth temple, the millennial temple, Ezekiel's temple. It says, mark well who may enter the house and not, and all who go out from the sanctuary. Okay, now verse six, say to the rebellious, to the house of Israel, meaning Ephraim, meaning Joseph, meaning us, okay, we need to take this to heart. We need to listen to this. Therefore, thus says Yahweh Elohim, O house of Israel, let us have no more of your abominations. Okay, now, brothers, what this means is he's speaking to us in the end times. Okay, and what he's saying is no more abominations. Okay, what's he talking about? He's talking about the Messianic and Ephraimite movement. He's talking about people doing bringing strange fire before Yahweh, basically. Verse 7, he says, Now when you brought in foreigners, uncircumcised in heart and uncircumcised in flesh, to be in my sanctuary to defile it. Now, I just imagine we're talking about the house of Asaph here. My house, not your house, it's my house. Okay, when you offered my food and the fat and the blood, and they broke my covenant because of all of your abominations. So, verse 80 says, And you have not kept charge of my set-apart things, but you have set others to keep charge of my sanctuary for you. So, whether we're talking about an Asavite priesthood or a Protestant priesthood, which is an extension of Asav, or the Messianic movement, which is still a mess, still disorganized, still not a thing of order because of all these preachers and teachers that have been preaching disorganization. 
Okay, the rabbinical order also, the messianic rabbinical order, also does not yet preach Yahweh's, Yeshua's organization. So pray, pray with us that that will change. There's some brilliant people in the house of Judah. We just need to do things according to Scripture. So verse 9, thus says Yahweh Elohim, he's talking to Ephraim here, no foreigner, uncircumcised in heart, we think we get that, or uncircumcised in flesh, that causes a lot of people a lot of concern, shall enter my sanctuary, including any foreigner who is among the children of Israel. So that means we need to obey Yahweh's Torah, period, or we're not coming in. We need to be circumcised. We need to obey everything that Yahweh's Torah says to do, everything that Tanakh says to do, everything Yahweh's voice says to do. He continues, and we're going we're gonna to bring this to a point here and also talk about it in the Renewed Covenant section. It's a lot of material. That's a great parasha. He says, and the Levites who went far away from me when Israel went astray. We'll talk about this in just a minute. Because when the 10 tribes were taken into captivity by Assyria, the Assyrians also took many, uh, all but or most of the walled cities of Judah. Okay, so Judah got taken into the Assyrian captivity as well. So we have many brothers and sisters with the house of Judah sojourning with the house of Joseph or Ephraim. Okay, so, but the Levites who went into captivity... Okay, they went far away from Yahweh because somehow we weren't getting taught. I'm not trying to pass responsibility. It's our ultimate responsibility. But according to this verse, we weren't really getting taught right. Okay, so it says, When Israel went astray, when our forefathers set up golden calves in Dan and Beit El, because the prophecy is going to be fulfilled, uh, we weren't getting taught right. Okay, judging from the Talmud today, I need, Father willing, I need to get time to analyze what's really going on there with, with Levy's personality, with Judah's personality. And what, why are we there? Why this? Why Talmud? Why replacement theology? It doesn't make sense. Anyway, so when that northern house of Israel went astray, why did we go astray? Were we getting raised right? Were we getting taught right? Were the Levites doing their job? Okay, some of them weren't doing their job, and there's various theories, and it would take too long to unpack. But someone is going to bear their iniquity in the house of Levi for not having done their job. Okay, that's what that says. Okay, now here we take a look at how we got mixed into the two. There's some of Israel with Judah, and there's some of Judah with Israel. So come to Melachim Bet, or 2 Kings chapter 18 and verse 11, starting in verse 11. It says, then the king of Assyria carried Israel away captive to Assyria. Why? Because we weren't listening to Yahweh's voice and we weren't doing what, what was recorded of his voice speaking early. We didn't do what was written. We didn't, we didn't listen. We didn't do what was written. We weren't interested. We had other priorities. We had other things. And we are their descendants. So, and he put them in Hala and by the Habor, the river of Gozan, and the cities of the Medes. Go to verse 12, because why? We did not obey the voice of Yahweh, our Elohim, kind of like now, but we transgressed his covenant and all that Moshe, the servant of Yahweh, commanded us to do. We wouldn't hear it and we for sure wouldn't do it, kind of like now. Verse 13, this very next verse, and in the 14th year of King Hezekiah, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the fortified cities of Judah and took them. Okay, so obviously some Jews would also get taken into captivity at that point. They didn't care. They didn't stop at the border. They, they just took whatever they could take. That's how they did things back then, kind of like how they do things now. So coming back to Yehezkel or Ezekiel chapter 44 and verse 11, okay, now it says, yet they, <clears throat> so they were talking about the backslidden, lost uh, Levites, okay, they can still be ministers in the sanctuary. They can still be gatekeepers of the house and ministers of the house. They can still offer the burnt offerings. They can slay the burnt offering and the sacrifice for the people, and they shall stand before them to minister to them. Now, just take a pause, a uh, liquid pause here. Uh, the concept among Ephraim between teaching and ministering 
It's like Ephraim has forgotten completely that there are ministerial roles other than teaching. It's other things that need to be done. There's, there's a first tithe ministry. There's also a third tithe ministry. There's also a family second tithe ministry, if you like to call it that. There's a lot of things that need to be done. Get some liquid. Why? Because they ministered to Ephraim before their idols. So there's big history. We don't have time to unpack it here. We're going to try and put it in the history section for the prime minister, the video series for the prime minister and for the Knesset. <clears throat> but they ministered to Ephraim before their idols and caused the house of Israel to fall into iniquity. Now, Joseph, we need to take responsibility for ourselves and our own actions. That's a big deal in the house of Joseph. Okay, but we didn't get good inputs. Okay, these good, these bad inputs caused the house of Israel to fall into iniquity. Therefore, he has raised his hand in an oath against them, says Yahweh Elohim, and they shall bear their iniquity. Okay, so if you didn't do your job right, you can come close, but obviously not high priest. Verse 13. And they shall not come near to me to minister to me as priest, nor come near any of my set-apart things, nor into the Kodesh HaKodeshim, but they shall bear their shame and their abominations which they have committed. So in other words, well, verse 14, Nevertheless, okay, I will make them keep charge of the temple for all its work and for all that has to be done in it. And there's so many people that don't have the understanding and the concept that there's m there's more to the ministry. So the ministry is supposed to be a global spiritual government. That's what we're trying to build for Yeshua. It needs all the checks, all the balances, all the everything, but mostly it needs participation and involvement by caring people who love Yeshua and want to do all that they can to serve him. So now let's talk about those who are wanting to do all they can to serve him. Chapter 44 and verse 15, Yahweh continues, he says, But those priests, the Levites, the sons of Zadok, the good ones who kept charge of my sanctuary when the children of Israel went astray from me. And I assume these are ones whose heart was for service for Yahweh. Maybe they were confused in doctrine, but their hearts were toward service to Yahweh. And they served. When the children of Israel went astray from me, so they still were serving, they shall come near me to minister to me. They shall stand before me to offer the fat and the blood, says Yahweh Elohim. Okay, verse 16, they shall enter my sanctuary and they shall come near my table to minister to me and they shall keep my charge because they cared, because they stuck with the service and there's refinement that goes to living the word. You have to live the word if you're going to be a minister. Now, in we're just going to jump here. Just put your thumb there. We're going to jump to Yeshayahu or Isaiah chapter 66 and verse 21. We've seen in past parashiot that at the time of the ingathering, when the house of Joseph, the house of Ephraim comes home, that there will be some within the house of Ephraim, the house of Joseph, that will be taken also for priests and for Levites. Uh, how exactly that's going to work at the granular level, I'm going to let Yahweh sort that one out. I don't, be, I, I don't, that's not my decision. But here it says right here that there will be some of us who will serve as priests and as Levites. And so what I take this all together as is if that's your desire, if you feel on your heart that one day you want to be a priest or a Levite, because this is coming right up, then you need to get involved, brother, sister. You need to get involved. You need to help your family get involved in Yeshua's work. That's what we're here trying to do is Yeshua's work. It's a participant sport, not a spectator sport. It's a participant sport. Coming back to Yehezkel 44 and verse 19, you know, when they go to the outer court, 
the outer court of the people, they shall take off their garments in which they have ministered. Uh, in other words, the garments have a certain set-apartness. They also have a certain power. Okay, they shall be left in the set-apart chambers, and then they will put on other garments. They'll put on their street clothes. But in their set-apart garments, they shall not set the people apart. Okay, there's, there's special powers involved in all these things. We don't have time to unpack it here. Also talks about their haircuts. Verse 20, they shall neither, if this is talking about the Levitical priesthood, the reestablished, restored Levitical priesthood that's going to have some of Ephraim merged into it. Okay, they shall neither shave their heads, nor shall they let their hair grow long. So the Nazarite vow is out, but they shall keep their hair well trimmed. And you can see a lot of Judah adopts this uh, already today. They have they just let the beard grow long, and then they, they keep the rest of their hair well trimmed. Verse 24, in controver again, in controversy, they shall stand as judges. And here's the only thing. They need to judge these matters and these disputes according to Yahweh's judges in the Tanakh. They need to keep Yahweh's Torah, the Torah of Moshe, the written Torah and keep Yahweh's statutes and all of his appointed meetings and his Shabbats, his Sabbaths. So, continuing forward, chapter 45, next chapter coming to verse 19, it says, Now, the priest shall take some of the blood of the sin offering, and so you shall do on the seventh day of the month for everyone who has sinned unintentionally or in ignorance. Thus you, make, you shall make atonement for the people. And this word unintentional is used and abused and completely forgotten about. Okay, now, brothers and sisters, when you know what to do and you just don't want to do it, okay, that's not called unintentional sin. That's called rebellion. Okay, and there's a lot of, I just know from being in the house of Ephraim since 1999, 57, 59. There's a lot of us that know things that we're supposed to be doing. We know we're supposed to read this book and apply it to our life. We're supposed to read this book, supposed to say, how can I adopt this? How can I live this way? No matter, I mean, both for the good and for the evil, the commitment parts. Oh, the commitment parts, that's what we call evil. Okay, but these things, these are wrong attitudes. These are these are things that should not be. Okay, so we're going to see the role of the prince. So Ezekiel 45, starting in verse 21, it says, And in the first month, on the 14th day of the month, you shall observe the Pesach, a feast of seven days. Unleavened bread shall be eaten. Verse 22, And on that day, the prince, the Nasi, shall prepare for himself and for all the people of the land, a bull for a sin offering. Okay, now, who here thinks that's Yeshua offering for himself a bull for a sin offering? You know, there's a lot of ministries. They've, they've taught we're going to be snatched away in the millennium, we're going to be gone, or Yeshua's going to be here during the millennium, and he's going to rule and reign. We're going to have 144,000 chairs all lined up to his left which if you do the math, you end up in the Mediterranean. You know, there's some crazy theories out there. <laughs> so, but this, this says, this Nasi, and we'll talk about, we'll unpack the role of the Nasi in other places, but this Nasi, he's a hereditary ruler. We're going to see, and on that day, the prince shall prepare for himself and for all the people of the land, a bull for a sin offering that cannot be Yeshua because Yeshua was the spotless, sinless lamb. He doesn't need to offer a sin offering for himself. Okay, these are ritual sacrifices. This isn't Yeshua's sacrifice we're talking about here. If you're, we talk all about that in the Nazarene Israel study. So uh, please check that if you have confusion on that. Now let's come here to Ezekiel 46 and verse 16. It says, Thus says Yahweh Elohim, If the Nasi gives a gift of some of his inheritance to any of his sons, it shall belong to his sons. It is their possession by inheritance. Okay, now who here thinks that's Yeshua? Do you, do you think Yeshua is going to take an earthly wife and he's going to have earthly sons 
so he can give some of his inheritance to his earthly sons. That makes no sense to us. We, we, don't, we don't understand that. Okay, so we talk all about that in our studies on Revelation and the end times. It's also called Revelation Simplified on YouTube. So now we come to our Brit Hadashah, or our Renewed Covenant portion. And we're going to see how the principles and the precepts that we saw in Vaikra or Leviticus, and also the same principles and precepts that we saw operating in the role of the Nasi in Yehezkel, are going to apply in the Renewed Covenant. Okay, so as we saw before, the functions of a Levitical priesthood include, first and foremost, performing the commanded rituals. Now, these are some very important rituals. So we're attempting to reestablish the conditions of Eden in effectively a portable garden restaurant and later in the temple, a fixed established restaurant, but a very special one where we can commune with Elohim. Also, they had various other duties, maintenance, security, receiving the people's tithes, distributing the people's tithes. Uh, also, they were to teach Yahweh's people the difference between what was set apart and what's profane. So also they were to render righteous judgments in disputes. We already saw that. Let's compare to Yeshua's function as the high priest of the order of Melchizedek. This is his role as Mashiach Nagid coming as he did at the end of the second temple era. So the first thing he did is he rebuked man's traditions in favor of Yahweh's commandments. So he got away from the zugo pairs. He got away from uh, bracketing and this kind of a thing in favor of hearing and obeying the word of his father, Yahweh Elohim. Just hear, the, hear what Yahweh's voice says to do and do it, including all of his written commandments and precepts and statutes. So he did teach Yahweh's people the difference between what was set apart and the profane, also by teaching the principles and the precepts thereof because when we were in the dispersion, we wouldn't know. We, we didn't know everything about the Torah. We didn't know everything about the Levitical order. And plus, we weren't in the land. So we had to take the same principles and precepts of advancing Yahweh's kingdom and advance his kingdom while we were still in the dispersion. Okay, Yeshua also taught Yahweh's righteous judgments. He taught us how to come and to come to and render a righteous judgment in a dispute. Uh, that's in Matthew chapter 18, the Matthew 18 process. And again, he taught the principles and the precepts of the Torah so that one day the house of Joseph, when it would come home, we would learn new specifics. We'd learn new, uh, new exact specifics of the ways, but we'd already have the same principles and precepts. So keeping the principles and precepts in the land, that's for the Levitical order. Keeping Yahweh's principles and precepts outside the land, that's order of Melchizedek. And there's an enduring role for the order of Melchizedek during the millennium. Okay, now let's just see how he did this. So in Luke chapter 11 and verse 1, now it came to pass, as Yeshua was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said to him, Adon, teach us to pray also, as Yohanan also taught his disciples. So he said to them, when you pray, say, our Father in heaven, here's a big list of things that I want. Please give me the list of things that I want. Thank you for the things you gave me before. Give me, 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 amen. Oh, no, wait. <clears throat> okay, uh, just to mention this, the difference between Christian prayer and Hebraic prayer is that in Christian prayer, we pray for what we want to have a nice life out in the world, out among the nations. Whereas in Hebrew prayer, we're praying for Yahweh to establish his will. We're asking to be agent. You know, Here I am, choose me. That's what we're talking about in Hebrew prayer. And that's what Yeshua prayed. So he said to them, when you pray, say, our Father in heaven, set your name apart, build your fame, build your glory. It's by your name and your glory that we're going to have a world worth living in. We want a world worth living in, Father. We want something better for our children. Therefore, please help your kingdom to come. Help us to establish your kingdom. Help us to do your will here on earth as it's done in heaven, even though it's not convenient to do your will here on earth. 
because everyone's predatory unless they have Yeshua's spirit. So let your will be done, Father. That's a hard thing to pray. Please help conform us to your will. Please help us to build your son's kingdom. Verse 3 says, give us day by day our daily bread and forgive us our sin. It doesn't say our daily bread and a mansion and a yacht and vacation time and a 401k plan. It doesn't say that. Okay, we need what we need to serve him today. Verse 4, and forgive us our sins as we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And this is so important. It's one of these subjects that everyone preaches it, almost no one practices it, and yet all are content to hear it. But are we conforming ourselves to this commandment? He says, and do not lead us into temptation to sin, but deliver us from the evil one. Now, there's a lot of things we could say here. We want to keep moving. Uh, spend a lot of time on the questions this week, and I think that was good. There were some very good questions, and they, they need to be dealt with. But we're coming back to the questions here in this next verse. And so Yeshua is telling us what we really need to be praying for is to be conformed to his will to become tools in his hands, to become his hands and his feet, as it were. That's what we need to be praying for. But what do most of us pray for? A better job, more money, more time for whatever. Do we pray how to build his kingdom? Do we pray how to be better, more pleasing servants to him? Do we pray and ask him to take away anything in us that is not pleasing to him? Well, if we don't do that, there's a big problem. Let me get some liquid. And now I say this as a fallen human being, as a sinner, and as someone who is trying to hand the rest of my life over to Yeshua and let him direct, let his spirit direct. What Yeshua tells us in Luke 11, verse 24, he says, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, like went out of me when I got called to repentance, other things I've had to repent of. Okay, so that unclean spirit okay, is going to go through dry places, seeking rest. But it's not going to find any. So what it's going to do is going to wait till, you, till we're not looking. It's going to wait until we're not paying attention, and then it's going to come back to the house. Now we've been cleansed. Everything's all nice. When he comes, he finds it swept and put in order, verse 25 says. Okay, now, what this is talking about, this is talking about the moment, you know, and maybe not everyone has this, but when you first get called, you just have that crushing conviction. It's like, oh, I've just messed up so bad, I just really need to do whatever I can with the rest of my life for him. I don't know if everyone has that conviction experience or doesn't have that conviction experience, but there's that temptation to sin. It's always there because sin crouches by the door and his desire is for us, but we have to rule over it. You can't keep Torah on accident. That just doesn't happen. You're not going to fall into Torah keeping like you might fall into a ditch. You're going to fall into Torah keeping like you fall in love, so to speak. Okay, real relationships take work. <laughs> so the Torah is a real covenant relationship with Elohim. It's a bridal contract. And we have to keep his house cleaned and swept and put in order. It's not easy. He's asking us to establish the kingdom of heaven here on earth basically the same thing. So it's all, it's all one instruction at a certain level. So we're asking him to send his spirit in us to help us establish his kingdom on earth. And if we don't do that, mystery Babylon comes, mystery Babylon enters in. And now we find ourselves doing worship that we call it the worship of Yahweh, but it's not the worship of Yahweh. Okay, Yeshua likens that to seven unclean spirits 
verse 26. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, seven being symbolic, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than at the first. And brother, if you are a messianic minister, or if you call yourself a messianic rabbi, okay, or if you call yourself a messianic pastor or messianic teacher, and you're not helping to unify the body on a single foundation of apostles and prophets, preaching the original doctrine, then what are you doing? You're leading his people astray. That's what you're doing. And we had some questions from some people that really uh, sounds like they just didn't get good instruction. Or maybe they're listening to instruction because they want a broad, easy road. They're not searching out the instruction. I don't know. But brother, if you're teaching anything other than adherence to exactly what Yeshua said to do, what are you doing? Luke 12 and verse 31, Yeshua says, seek first the kingdom of Elohim. Okay, if you're not doing that, what are you doing? Well, but I have to do this and I have to. No, seek first the kingdom of Elohim. Then you have a relationship with Yeshua and do everything he says to do. Then you have the right relationship with Yeshua. Then you have the wedding garment. You've entered in. Then everything you need to serve him will be added to you in his way and in his time. It's not always easy. It's not always fun, but it's always his way and it's his time. And there's a joy and a satisfaction in that. You just can't get anywhere else, any other way. Verse 32, he says, do not fear, little flock. Don't, don't fear to enter in. Don't fear to make a bridal commitment to me. Don't fear to take on the role of hearing my voice and doing what I say, including all of the written commandments. He says, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom if only you will just enter in. My life is, a, I don't know, a hundred, a thousand times better than it was ever before. It's so much better. To know Elohim, to know Yeshua, is to know peace. To know that you are in his will, you're walking in his word and in his spirit. There's a blessing in that. You're not going to get any other way. And there's a blessing in the day of judgment you're going to get that isn't going to come any other way. And all of this is a function of entering into relationship with Elohim. Okay, It's not easy. It's not cheap. You can't just get it by filling your head with knowledge. You have to enter in. You have to make a commitment. You have to make a decision for Yeshua to walk the original first century faith. And it costs. So as Luke chapter 12, starting in verse 33 be real with Elohim. Sell what you have and give alms. Provide yourselves money bags in the spiritual realm, which do not grow old. A treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth is going to destroy it. Because where you put your money, that's where your heart's going to be. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You know, it's, it's often said, you can tell what a man cares about by where does he spend his time and where does he spend his money. Take a look at his day timer and take a look at his financial statement. That'll tell you what he cares about. Okay. Do we care about Yahweh Elohim? Okay. It only takes commitment of our time and our money. Like any marriage, if you're going to enter into a marriage, your time and your money are no longer yours. Now it's your opportunity to help build the relationship. And that's what Yeshua wants us to do. He wants us to build his kingdom for his father in his absence. It's the parable of the meanest. So, you know, it's like the same thing every week. We, we have the same message every week. Enter into relationship with Yeshua. Make a commitment to yourself to get in connection with him and hear his voice and let him instruct you and do what he says including all everything that's written that he said before. Because what, are we going to make him repeat himself? Come on. So Luke chapter 12, starting in verse 42, and the master said, who then is that faithful and wise steward 
Who then is that true servant leader who loves Yeshua, whom his master will make ruler over his household to give them their portion of food in due season? Okay, who is feeding his people? Who is taking care of his people according to his word? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Blessed are you when you do what Yeshua says to do, because when he returns, he's going to see this one is set apart. This one has oil for his or her, in that parable's case, lamp. This one took time to prepare. This one has the wedding garment. This one is helping to build my kingdom even though they're still in dispersion, or maybe you're in the land of Israel. I don't know. So verse 44, he says, verse 44, he says, truly I say to you that he will make him ruler over all that he has. What an awesome inheritance is that? All we have to do is hear Yeshua's voice and obey it. That's all we have to do. But faithfully, and everything that he says, verse 45, but if that servant says in his heart, oh, it got cut out there. Uh, we have a typo there. So if that servant says in his heart, my master is delayed in his coming, and he begins to eat and drink and be drunk and beat the male and female servants and preach that, no, you don't have to do everything the Torah says. You just have to buy my books and tapes. You buy misleading people, teaching wrong things, teaching against organization teaching against order, verse 46, the master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him and that an hour when he is not aware and will cut him in two and will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. Why? It's because he's teaching something other than what Yeshua said to do. And what did Yeshua teach to do? We have to obey the Torah of Moshe even better than the Prushim. Then the Haredim, how are you going to do that without hearing Yahweh's voice and obeying it? You can't do anything prophetic. You can't hear in the, well, if you can't hear in the spirit, you can't hear in the spirit. How are you going to hear from him? It doesn't make sense. It doesn't work. Chapter 12, verse 47, and that servant who knew his master's will, and yet he did not prepare himself, and he did not do according to his master's will, he shall be beaten with many stripes. Verse 48, but he who did not know, this is coming back to the question number two, people, they've never been exposed to the truth. Because why? Because no one has sent the word forth. But he who did not know, yet committed things deserving of stripes, he shall be beaten with few or fewer. For to everyone to whom much is given, from him much will be required. And to whom much has been committed, of him they will ask the more. And again, this brings us back to question number two. Why do we have to do anything? Why do we have to make an effort? Aren't we set apart just because we're reading about what we're supposed to be doing? It's like, I don't understand how Ephraim can can possibly think that we're going to get away with that. Okay, verse 49, Yeshua tells us, I came to send a fire on the earth and how I wish it were already kindled. Okay, if you have visions of Yeshua as a big huggy, huggy guy, okay, how does this fit into that? Verse 50, but I have an immersion to be immersed with and how distressed I am until it is accomplished. Okay, what immersion? What what immersion are we talking about? Verse 51, he says, do you suppose that I came to give peace on the earth? You suppose I came to bring shalom, do you? Okay, not at all, but rather division. For now on, five in one house will be divided, three against two and two against three. Verse 53, father will be divided against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother mother-in-law, and everyone's fragmented. Okay, well, (sighs) this is the reality for the house of Ephraim today. Okay, we're in transition. We don't have time to unpack this all here. We talk about this in some detail in the Nazarene Israel study. Father willing, we'll talk about it in the Abraham Accords series as well. But this is just a screenshot from when the Methodist Church recently split. 
So this is the difference between Asavite Christians and Josephite Christians. And uh, just let me see if I can say this briefly. Uh, basically, the, the big difference is Asav teaches love without law, so to speak. So love without law. Okay, well, that's an open door for the devil. Okay, Joseph understands, no, no, no. You have to have rules. You have to have laws. It doesn't work any other way. Okay. However, as we're going to see, Joseph is always in the minority. So all through scripture, there's this one in 10 rule, so to speak. So about one in 10 came back from the exile to Babylon. And about one in 10 came back to give Yeshua thanks. It just, it, this is a, a pattern that runs repeatedly. Okay, this is a slide from an old presentation. I don't have, to, we don't have time to unpack this here. This is a whole, we hope to unpack this in the Abraham Accords mega series. But what you have here is that the history of Ephraim is a history of splits, a history of breakups, a history of just like what we saw in the Methodist church, breaking up into two more units or more because Worldwide Church of God is another example. But here, let's take a look. So Ephraim went outside the land where the Torah was not understood to be a marital contract. And so the faith changed. So, uh, and then over the generations, we have slowly returned as Yahweh's prophecies are being fulfilled. So here we have 732 BCE. That's when we went into the Assyrian diaspora or the seeding or the great dispersion. And if we talk about this in the Nazarene Israel study, if you run the numbers and you do the math, Ezekiel 4 tells us we would be in the dispersion for 2,730 years. And so you come to the time, well, we'll talk about that other places. It's too much to unpack here. But we see this, this slow, so in 732 BCE, Ephraim fell away. And also those of Levi who were with Ephraim, with Joseph, we all fell away. Now, 325 CE, and again, so this is probably be misunderstood. Let me just let me just say this again. Three twenty five C E with the official formation of the Roman Catholic Church, uh, the Catholic faith, the Universalist faith. To continue with question number two, that became the the official religion of the Roman Empire. So at that point, it was yeah, you know Sunday go meeting or be dead it was basically. Those were your choices. Those were your options. Or even if you weren't killed, you certainly didn't rise to any position of prominence. Because it was the church and uh, participation was expected in most settings. So we went into the dispersion and the papacy, don't misunderstand what I'm saying, the papacy actually did us a favor of sorts by bringing us back into the faith of Messiah at the point of the sword. Okay, not friendly, not pleasant, not a lovely thing, but look how Yahweh used it for good. It's the same thing as we talked about before. If we had done what we were supposed to do in the garden, it wouldn't have been necessary for a fall. If we had done what we were supposed to do as we came out of Egypt, it would have been two or three weeks. But no, we, we continue to disobey. We don't want to do his thing. We want to do our own thing. So now Yahweh is leading us the long way around because <clears throat> we weren't willing to do it his way. And only 10% of us are going to return ultimately. So, uh, but here we have, this is just a, yeah, we'll just have to unpack this in the Abraham Accord series. So we had the Assyrian diaspora began in 732 BCE is when we got kicked out. We're not supposed to come back till between 1996 to 2000, that time window, that time frame. But there's also three waves. We'll unpack all that later. So 325 CE, uh, point of the sword, come love a Jewish Asavite Christ. Okay, you can look up Daniel chapter 7 and verse 25. Uh, and that lasted for a time, times, and half a time of Daniel 7 and verse 25. And then we had effectively Martin Luther that slide is off. It says 1519. It should be 1517. That's an old slide. Uh, so 1517 CE, Martin Luther said, no, wait a minute. Why are we paying attention to a man's words? Why are we paying attention to man's traditions? Okay, so why don't we pay attention only to scripture? Yeah, that was the concept behind sola scriptura. And from that point forward, that was a great advance for the house of Ephraim. 
huge advance because now we're no longer listening to the words of the Pope. Now we're reading the words of Elohim. So what a major blessing that was. The downside, again, is that everyone has an interpretation, everyone has an opinion, and the vast majority want a broad, easy road to walk after. So uh, this is the season that we're in, brothers and sisters. Uh, you're not going to come home. We're not going to come home if we don't actually do what his word says. That's what it says. So then we had other advances. Then come 1844, you had Ellen G. White with the Seventh-day Adventist, the Millerite movement. So she had the concept, let's keep the Sabbath. And well, that was well received by the Seventh-day Adventists, and it's still to this day mocked by most of Christianity. Uh, then come 1930, can you see the slow step by step or climbing the rungs of Jacob's ladder? We're going up little by little, step by step. Come in the 1930s, you had Herbert W. Armstrong of the Worldwide Church of God, and he said, let's keep the feasts. And I believe they did have the concept of being the lost tribes. I'm not, I'm not an expert on uh, worldwide doctrine, but again, can, you, can we see that it was an advancement? We're stepping our way closer and closer. Okay, and then come the 1970s, you began to get Angus and Bacha Wooten, and they eventually formed the Messianic Israel Alliance. And uh, I came in in 1999 and uh, basically learned, so I picked up at that point. So but can, can we see the steps, little by little, trying to get back to the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints? Can we see, little by little, Ephraim coming back to the Torah? And I wish I had, I think it's uh, Rabbi, I want to say Yitzhak Breidowitz. I'm, I'm not sure. I, I'll see if I can find his video clip. I'll try and play it for you. So, but Rabbi Breidowitz is saying, you know, effectively, yes, it was a good thing for the church because it brings Gentiles at least somewhat. I, I don't want to misquote him. I'll see if I can find the clip. It was a very good, there is that understanding uh, on the Levite and Judahite side of the house uh, the big thing is for Ephraim just to differentiate himself from Aesop. Okay, so this is good. Can we see these steps going on here? Okay, but if you don't make it all the way back up to the original, you don't make it all the way back up to Yeshua's level, then you don't make it all the way back up to Yeshua's level. And that's a death penalty offense in the end. That's why only 10% comes back. So this is deadly serious stuff. On the other side, we have, I don't know if he's zero or, or who, but uh, we have Brother Judah, very smart people, very uh, intellectual people, very capable people, uh, the kingship gifting. They also have the Levitical priesthood gifting. They've got another agenda. Okay, we're talking about the house of Joseph, the house of Ephraim. We're needing to differentiate ourselves from the rest of the house of Asaph, including Protestantism including messianism we have to come back to a jewish form of the worship which is the min hanetzarim the sect of the nazarenes okay on the other side there's a movement so, so if, <laughs> if i can so i I'd have to look up the quotation but in daniel it says that the fourth beast is dreadfully strong and it tramples down and breaks in pieces the rest of the world so trampling down and breaking in pieces the old world order to establish a new and more connected new world order with uh, Zira originally at first in charge. And then after Armageddon, then we'll have a true line of parrots leader. I mean, I, we don't know what tribe the Nazi comes from, but uh, uh, we'll, see, we'll see true leadership from the house of Judah after Armageddon, after the ingathering. And in the meantime, this is what we got, is fragmented and breaking things down. But again, you know, never let a good apocalypse go to waste. I mean, this is where we are, brothers and sisters. So doors open, are we going to go in and witness? Or doors open, we're going to say, why do we need to do anything? Why we read about what we're supposed to be doing. We read about what Paul, didn't Paul do everything? Didn't Paul make all his missionary voyages? Okay, brothers and sisters, we need to get active. I believe this is a common failing in the house of Ephraim is just the f don't feel like we need to get involved. Judah gets involved, but at the wrong thing. Ephraim knows what the right thing is. He just doesn't want to do it. 
because it takes too much of his time and too much of his money. Okay, brothers and sisters, how are we going to survive the end times with attitudes like that? How are our children going to survive the end times with attitudes like that? Okay, so this is what it means when Yeshua is talking in verse Luke chapter 12 and verse 53. He says, father will be divided against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Okay, what does that look like? Does it look like the Methodist church breakup? Look like fragmentation? I've had people ask me, it's like, you know, what, what goes on? I mean, because you, you, you start to come to the Hebraic walk and your family just goes off. Or your family is like, everyone has a story about this, but the, not everyone in your family understands. And that's what's happening is these kinds of splits. So you've got a split in the Methodist church. You've got a split in Latin America here. You've got a split in the Catholic church. The Catholic church is going down because people know that that's not, many people here are still faithful Catholics, but many more people, they know there's an Elohim. They know there's something, but they don't think they're seeing it faithfully presented in the Asavite church. So there's windows, there's openings. Okay, are we walking through those openings? When Yahweh opens a door, are we ready to go? Do we say, here I am, choose me? Okay, are we helping those who are going? Okay, so what we have seen in this presentation is that Yeshua functions as the high priest of the order of Melchizedek. And there are several things he does that's the same principles and precepts as in the Torah portion and as in the Haftarah. Okay, so Yeshua rebuked man's traditions, okay, what we think we want. Okay, and if you're Messianic, uh, if, you're, if you're Judah or Levi, I want you to hear, ditch the Talmud, go back to Tanakh. Okay, and if you're House of Ephraim, it's, it's not just enough to read it, brother. You actually have to do it. You have to actually apply yourself. Life isn't about us anymore. Life isn't about what we want anymore. If we want to serve him, then we need to serve him according to his word. Okay, so Yeshua came to teach Yahweh's people the difference. If we will read his words and do what he says, we will see there's a huge difference, huge, huge, huge difference between what the Renewed Covenant says to do and what most of the house of Ephraim is doing today. I'm not even talking about the Christians who won't wake up until after Armageddon. The vast majority won't know who they are until after Armageddon. Then they will wake up, says Hoshea too. Okay, right now, though, we have a remnant that's called out early. We have a first wave. We'll talk about this in the Abraham Accords. What are we doing, first wave? Second wave's coming soon. What are we doing? Are we lost Levitical priests and we're looking for an opportunity to serve Yahweh so we can go back home and perhaps join the Levitical, the renewed Levitical order someday? It won't be me. I'm not symmetrical. I've got one leg longer than the other. I've got scoliosis, so I can't perform the priestly role. It's a very important role, and there are many, there will be a need for priests. I mean, it's not a small post. It's a big, it's a big position. There's a lot of people that are needed. The time to begin getting ourselves ready for that is now. The time to begin preparing our wedding garments is now. The time for beginning to make oil for our lamps is now. And that means hearing his voice and doing the things he says. Don't make him repeat himself. Why would we make him repeat himself? There's a whole, a whole renewed covenant to fulfill while we're in the dispersion, waiting to come back home. So... These are the things Yeshua did. Even though we can't fulfill the ceremonial law right now, some of us, brothers and sisters, says Isaiah 66, 21, some of us will fulfill those rituals and they'll be chosen because they understand the principles and the precepts. So that's what Yeshua did. So Brother Judah rejects Yeshua because Brother Judah is looking for a military leader. Can we see the reserves being called up? 
Can we see Yeshua bringing the lost Israelites home for the day of the final battle? These are our questions. We pray Yahweh will give you a good time of prayer and reflection and worship with him and that you'll consider these words and chew them over throughout the week. Happy chewing. Shabbat Shalom.